Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michelle Easton, president of the Claire Booth Luce Policy Institute. And I want to welcome you all here to our Conservative Women's Network Luncheon, and a special thanks to our partner, the Heritage Foundation. We've been doing this for a number of years now. And uh, representing the Heritage Foundation today is Angelise Schrader, who's the director of the Heritage Foundation's intern program. We're happy to have you up here with us. We're so pleased to have Ashley Couch and Kara Eschbach. Did I say that correctly? Forgive me. Close enough. Okay. <laughs> From Verily Magazine with us today. They're going to be talking about the role women's magazines play in our nation's culture and the different approach that they're taking at Verily. Ashley is the PR manager and contributing editor for Verily Magazine. Previously, she served as Director of Outreach and Programs for the Love and Fidelity Network, where she was a leadership coach to college students on 30 campuses nationwide. She taught students how to effectively advocate for traditional marriage, family, and healthy dating relationships uh, at universities. Ashley is an international speaker and a freelance journalist on women's issues focusing on the hookup culture, building healthy relationships, and beauty in the media. We're also proud that Ashley was an intern at the Claire Booth Loose Policy Institute in the summer of 2008. So we'll take full credit for all the things she's done. <laughs> and she recently spoke for us at a seminar we had in our office with about 20 uh, women college leaders on the hooking up culture and did a fabulous job at that. You know, we, we changed a lot of lives with that seminar. We've heard a lot yeah. of feedback from, from the girls. So your participation in that was very, very much appreciated. Uh, she earned her BA from the University of Dallas and currently lives in Manhattan. Kara is the co-founder, editor-in-chief, and publisher of Verily Magazine. And before starting Verily, she was on the investment team for Credit Suisse Secondary Private Equity Fund and has experience in corporate finance, accounting, consulting, and investment banking. She speaks and writes on women's issues, particularly on women in the media and women in the workplace and on entrepreneurship. She was formerly the host of Catching Up with Kara and Monica on Sirius XM Radio. She earned her BS with highest distinction from Purdue University, where she was a member of the Varsity, varsity Golf Team and selected as the class commencement speaker. Please join me in welcoming Ashley and Kara. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk a little bit about what we're doing and, and just about women and media and the culture. Um, it's obviously an issue that's very near and dear to our hearts. So. Um, so one of my favorite movies is Lord of the Rings. I guess it's a trilogy, but all of them. Um, and if you haven't seen it, in the second movie, there's a scene where Frodo and Sam, who are two of the main characters, are, are Harking up, I think it's Sarah Thungal, and they start talking about stories. And Sam, being a little bit of a dreamer, which is unusual for a, a hobbit, starts talking about these adventure stories and how you think that, that people have sort of just happened into them and, or that they, they were going to go out and charge forward with their lives and do some great adventure. And he says, really, you know, they, they find themselves in these places and they just said that I wasn't going to turn back. And then he turns and says to Frodo, I wonder what sort of a tale that we've fallen into. And I think that this is a question that most of us ask ourselves on a pretty regular basis. Maybe we don't say it in quite those words. I think it tends to be, what am I going to do when I graduate from college? What the heck is going on in this relationship? What do I want to do with my career? Do I want to be a mom? I think we stress about these things a lot, especially as women. Um, but for all of us, and these, these are stories or the narratives of our lives, and it's really important that we figure these things out. It's very important how we see ourselves and how we interact with the world and how we want to make decisions for our, ourselves. And of course, we don't live in a vacuum. We, we have influences from our family and the culture that we live in and where we grew up. I grew up outside of Detroit, and now I live in Manhattan. Those are two very different places, and <laughs> the way that people see the world. Um, and one of the things that I think affects us more than what many of us realize is the media that we consume. And we consume the equivalent of something like 15 and a half hours of media a day on average in this country. And it's, it's an incredible amount of information, images, words, advertisements that we're constantly being bombarded with. And even when I think when we have a really strong compass for what we want and where we're going, 
it can be the subtle play in the background of messages of who am I, who am I supposed to be, what are the expectations on me. And so I think that when you really start being critical of it, and part of how we came to start um, the magazine, was realizing that a lot of the messages that we're receiving don't actually jive with what we want in our hearts, or they're creating a lot of tension. And so and what is it about media today that is really causing that tension? And so we're going to explore that today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as Kara mentioned, um, media has a profound impact to play in the ways that we understand ourselves and the culture in which we live. And media influences a cultural landscape by shaping the storyline about who we should be and how we should look. So the story that the media tells us becomes the story that we tell ourselves. And the stories that we tell ourselves become who we are. So the media creates this sort of environment where it's like the air that we breathe and there's no possible way for us to be exempt from it. I like to say we live in a cult of cosmetic perfectionism, where programs like Photoshop facilitate the creation of what we call a man-made look. The overarching narrative that the media will present to us is that we need to be beautiful as women, and to be beautiful equals to be sexy. In order to be considered beautiful, we need to be sexually desirable. In the media, we see a lot of images. 90% of all the objectification images are towards women. So 90% of the media images, 90% uh, of sexual objectification that occurs in the media is towards women. We become used to seeing women plastered on billboards to sell cars, to sell beer, to sell air fresheners and teeth whitening. <laughs> but sometimes the woman's body is even made into the object which is being sold, such as a beer bottle. Women buy into this standard of beauty equals sexy, such as in this picture, which you see. Um, it's not a woman modeling for GQ. It's actually a Czech woman celebrating the recent election of herself as a member of parliament. <laughs> so she, along with seven other women recently elected into parliament, created an erotic calendar where they were celebrating their beauty as powerful women. And this is, not, this is just one of many, but there are others with um, women in bathtubs and other strange poses, um, which facilitates the point that we do internalize this message that to be powerful equals to be beautiful equals to be sexy. But the frame is actually quite narrow, <coughs> isn't it? So chats that results in um, the researcher Susie Orbach, she worked on the Global Dove study, um, the Campaign for Real Beauty, and she says that when it comes to strictly physical attributes, the images of manufactured femininity are rejected as being too narrow, inauthentic, and insufficient. So when we have only the narrow frame about what is beautiful, the result often ends up resulting in our own guilt or our shame that we won't ever achieve this unattainable standard. So we need to re-examine the story, which we've been told, and write a new one in which we are the principal characters. Uh, and actually, this is kind of the framework that we had observed in starting the magazine. So those who haven't heard the story before, um, it was really born out of a bunch of women out to brunch and somehow just lamenting women's magazines and lamenting the stories and the ways that they are constantly making us feel bad about ourselves. And the fact that the story and the storylines and these frames that they give us are usually ones that like, well, I kind of want some of that. Of course, I want to be beautiful, but then there's always something slightly skewed about it. So it's like, of course, we want to look our best and dress well, but then it's always you know, a sexy party dress. And the only reason why we're dressing is to get attention. Um, they, we must be desirable in a very particular body type. It's always lose 10 pounds fast or get harder abs, which I promise none of these things ever really work. Um, I was a big fan of all these magazines growing up. <laughs> Sad. Um, Same. The most important aspect of our romantic relationship is how much sex that we're having and how satisfied we are in bed. And I think that it's an incredibly diminishing view of the way that we view sexuality and relationships. And typically, it was, it's this also narrative of being a homemaker is completely unacceptable. We must be measured by how successful we are in our careers and how well we are being perceived in all these kinds of measures. And I think that, you know, for me, I worked on Wall Street, and you know, I certainly had a great time. I actually really loved my job. It's not like I think that women shouldn't be there. But I did come to realize that all of this messaging 
was an incredible amount of stress. And when I thought about leaving the industry for a, a host of reasons, I felt incredibly guilty about it. Cause I was like, well, I mean, that means that I'm like giving up the fight for women's equality and all of these things are like, why, why am I constantly getting these messages? And my co-founder, Janet, had worked at Elle magazine and she, she had decided not to stay on for a full-time position because she saw the effect that this, this constant messaging was having on her. And so she was the one who was like, yes, I would love to start my own magazine one day that's actually really good for women. And I was like, that's a great idea. That's something we should really look into because I think these are the messages that have to be combatant. And it's not just in magazines, it's pervasive everywhere. So these are statistics um, from the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. And even in family films, only one female, there's only one female character for every three male characters. Women are typically depicted as younger and more attractive than their male co-workers or um, their male sort of other characters. We're five times more likely to be shown as a sexual object and not just as a female character, but specifically a female character who's valued for her sexuality um, or for her sexiness. Um, and it's pretty infrequent that we're shown in leadership positions, although this luckily seems to be changing. And so you, know, you have things like that happening in our direct media and then the subtle messaging that we're getting, and Ashley was pointing to this earlier, is just the advertising that we're constantly being bombarded with. In 1971, people saw an average of 500 ads a day, and today we see almost 5,000 ads a day between television and looking online. And in all of these cases, what's amazing is that I've seen each one of these images in women's magazines. This is not a men's magazine problem. This is women advertising to other women by objectifying us. And it, it's one of these things where when you're constantly digesting this and you're constantly told that this is the way that I'm supposed to look. And it, these are even in the Victoria's Secret ad, it's a bunch of women who are sort of interchangeable. They're just there for their bodies. You don't see who the person is at all. Um, it keeps telling us in the messaging that, you know, we are only valuable for this. And maybe we're valuable for other things too, but ultimately our, our objectification, like our bodies and the way that we look is what's really important. Um, and that's what we're internalizing. And there's been a lot of really interesting research done uh, and a lot of surveys. And I think that the numbers are, are pretty compelling, that 69% of women say magazine pictures influence their ideal body shape. 65% of women, um, when they've reported their eating habits, um, they've been determined to have disordered eating uh, patterns. And the last one I think is probably the, the most upsetting for me personally. And that is that in, in 2012, they did a survey at Knox College and they brought in 60 girls between the ages of six and nine. And they gave them two different paper dolls. One was a girl who was in a bustier and leather, like knee-high boots and very sexy looking. And the other was a girl in jeans and a sweater, very modestly dressed, sort of trendy but normal looking. And they asked these girls a series of questions of how they perceived these two different girls and how, who they wanted to be. And 72% of them said that the sexy one was going to be the more popular one. And then at the end, they asked them, which one of these two girls do you want to be? And 68% of girls ages six, seven, eight, and nine said they wanted to be the sexy doll. At ages so, so young, they've already internalized that sexy is popular. Sexy is who you want to be. Sexy is how I get somewhere in the world. And I think that this is, this is something that we aren't even aware of as we become older. We think that you know, we're intelligent and empowered women, but we've been internalizing these same images for another 20 years, and this is how most of us end up thinking about ourselves. So I think there's been um, a lot of controversy over Photoshop, and, um, and this has been a really interesting point for us, and Ashley can talk a little bit more about our no Photoshop policy, but one of the things that I think people have really hit on is sort of, okay, we have all this objectification going on, and really the problem is that it's fake. Right, is that these girls don't even look this way. And then you can see it's insane that it would take Kiara Knightley on the left here and say that she, she needs to have her bust enhanced. So I think you can see from one to the other, it's significantly different. Um, and Kate Winslet was on the cover of GQ and they significantly slimmed down her thighs and her waist and uh, enhanced her bust. And even Kate Winslet spoke out and said, I don't even want to look like that girl. I don't look like that girl. So even celebrities are running into this. Um, but I think that it's twofold. On the first, on the first part, there's absolutely a, an element of this isn't even real, and we definitely need to be rejecting the fact that this isn't even what people look like. 
But on the other hand, you know, when we started doing photo shoots, a big thing for us was never showing women in very sexualized positions. And that's a, a choice of the photographer, usually. So if a photographer, let's say that even a girl is like walking down the street, if you're shooting up at her, the first thing that you're encountering is her legs and then you know all the way up her body, you're not seeing her as a person, you're seeing her body and then her face. And so thinking about the angles in which we approach things. And then afterwards we get images back. And of course you, you do have to edit for light and color and things like that to make it ready for print. So you're not having like a really dark image that you can't even see who the person is. You do want to do some, some correction. Photoshop does have some good applications as well. <laughs> um, but what, what ultimately ends up happening is that they're like, oh, well, we'll just you know, smooth out her skin so that the light looks better. And we would get photos back where I would have to send them back to the photographer and say, like, this doesn't even look like real skin. Like, this is an android person robot. Like, I don't know what, I, no. <laughs> like, let's go back to that earlier version where it looks like she has real skin. Um, and I think from that, we ended up having to just come up with a blanket statement that we told photographers. We're like, don't take out any wrinkles. You can't make her look slimmer than she is. There's no, like, you know, funny adjusting with the, you know, her actual body proportions. Because we think that women are beautiful as they are, and that if we're going to fight all these frames of seeing us as sexy all the time, and that our bodies are the most worthwhile thing of us, then we have to create imagery that actually shows women being beautiful and lively and excited about life to say that, yeah, we're holding this up as beautiful and not, not necessarily having to shout about it, but just showing women, you're like, oh, they look really great and I want to look that way. And look, they haven't been altered and they're smiling and it's totally different. So I think that was sort of the first step towards what we have as our, you know, no Photoshop policy, which I'll let Ashley talk a little bit more about. Sure. Um, yeah, so basically what we're talking about here is that our beauty becomes synonymous with being sexy and also a lot of times going back to the stats that Kara mentioned with the small girls ages six to nine, how many of us played with Barbies growing up that taught us what glamour and beauty looks like? I know that they were always seen as like the, the beautiful ideal, um, which is absolutely unattainable, but then there's also, of course, Bratz and all these other shows. Um, and as we grow up, I know in junior high, one of the messages that I always heard was, if you've got it, flaunt it. And so we begin to see our own beauty as a tool which we can use for the attainment of power or success. And that if we can only look a certain way, then we will achieve that um, standard of happiness that we all strive after, um, and rightly so, but it's, it's a wrong avenue of getting there. Um, and if we can see from the politician from earlier, this has absolutely become the case. And you know, it's very damaging when you think about um, women who grow up with all of these messages, and another study was done that showed that girls, um, they, they, it was done by Dove, and they researched 1,200 um, girls ages 10 to 17, and 72% of them felt immense pressure to look beautiful, but when they researched globally women across the world in all different countries, only 4% of them felt comfortable calling themselves beautiful. So this way of using ourselves and our bodies as a tool actually not only reduces our understanding of what beauty truly is, but it also goes a further step which is harmful between women by setting us up as competitors between each other. That all of a sudden, every other woman's beautiful become a beauty becomes a threat to my own attainment of power and success. So we walk into the party and we ex immediately examine who's the prettiest girl in the room. And whoever has the thinnest thighs and the flattest abs must be the happiest girl there, right? I mean, how many times do we compare ourselves to other women? So I think that's on a day-to-day -day basis a very harmful outcome. But I think, as Kara was mentioning, one really important role that Verily plays in the conversation is through the no Photoshop policy. And one thing that's been so powerful um, in, in these images you can see specifically, this is from the runway to railway section in the style section of the print issue of November, December. And um, it was the result of an actual model call where um, we, we put out on social media a, a chance for women to nominate their friends. So the whole idea was to challenge this culture of fear, which we've all been um, indoctrinated into, by creating a culture of affirmation between women. So women were able to nominate their girlfriends about why they thought they should grace the pages verily um, as a model in the runway to railway section. So we got hundreds of nominations, and then the ones who were nominated were able to apply. 
And in their application, it was fairly simple. But one thing that was very beautiful and heartwarming was that they had to deliver a statement of purpose about why they wanted to be in the pages. So after hundreds of nominations, there were dozens of applications, and I was responsible for going through all of them. And I was reading through the different blurbs, and at times getting really misty-eyed, because some of these women were saying their whole lives they'd had an eating disorder. They couldn't read any magazines because they were a trigger. And Verily was the first breath of hope that they had had that they could read without worrying about feeling worse about themselves. And so from those applications, um, they, we chose, Verily chose four women, and this is the result here. And um, the result was really profound, and I think you know, it, sh it stands to reason, you can see it here, that the, the real women actually are truly beautiful, despite what some pushback has been from the photographers, from the stylists saying, you know, we don't wanna shoot this girl. She's not the right size, she's not gonna look good. And in fact, that's not the case, <laughs> you know, they look fantastic, and um, yeah, so Karen can talk more about how Verily's the answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting, because I think um, you know, it's not only using girls who are non-professional models. Um, we also use professional models, and we try to show a really broad variety of women. And we work with a lot of plus-size models, and we work with you know, women of all different ethnicities, and you know, you're never gonna get a perfect mix, but we try really hard to really show the diverse set of women being beautiful in all different ways. Um, and, and I think in challenging women too, so we're not just a fashion magazine, so we cover fashion, relationships, culture, and lifestyle. Um, and we've had a lot of press for a couple of our articles, such as um, one that was talking about choosing to be a stay-at-home mom despite mm -hmm. having an elite degree. And I think that we're trying to shed light and start these conversations where we're saying, it's not just that we want to be beautiful, but we really want to have a much more holistic and fulfilled life and to be free to choose that. Um, we had a really interesting interview with, um, I'm blanking on her name, who's the one who did the sexy lie? Carolyn uh, Hellman? Yeah, Carolyn Hellman on, on the website and, and talking about like what does it really mean to be an empowered woman? And I thought she said something very interesting, mm -hmm. which was that to choose your own destiny and what you want and to choose the things that, that satisfy you and that as a society, one of the great ills of the last 50 years is that we've basically said that all the work that women do in the home is unvalued. Despite the fact, I think Chase Manhattan Bake does uh, a survey every year and they put a value on uh, what, what a woman would make if she were um, actually being charging for her services at home. It's something like $130,000 salary. I'm like, that's, that's pretty impressive for the amount of work that people are doing. But we as a society have said that, that we don't value those things as much anymore. And so often women feel guilty for wanting to choose that path or that we don't feel like we have the freedom to do that. And what I think what we found, um, you know, at least amongst our friends and the more that you know, all of these surveys come out and, and in our reaction from our readership is that Women want to feel naturally beautiful, and that doesn't mean that we, you know, roll out of bed and you know walk around in our sweatpants and look great immediately. Like I'd fully encourage showers and putting on some makeup is great, but I think that we want to feel is that we don't have to be so hyper made up all the time in order to just look acceptable to society, and that we aren't only using fashion to be sexy or to to be powerful to make a statement. We just you know want it to be fun, and we enjoy that expression of ourselves because we are saying something when we get dressed. There's a uniform that goes with that, and I think that, that that can be a really beautiful expression of who we are. And we're seeking a lot more balance. And so I think like by showing that women, not only can we talk about fashion and we can talk about relationships in our magazine, but we can talk about really serious issues like the rape culture in Egypt. We can talk about things like uh, porn and sort of the popular imagery of that and what does that really mean for us as a society. And I think we can have this balance of showing that women aren't just superfluous sometimes and that we turn that off and we go to work and we're always really serious and, and you know, go-getters at work and then we turn that off and then we're silly again at night. Absolutely not. I think that what we want to show is that these are all elements of who we are and that if we can integrate all of them and show that this is really who women are and who we want to be and how we want to live our lives, it gives us the freedom to say, yeah, I can make any of these choices and they're all good choices mm -hmm. and I don't have to feel ashamed or like I'm being less of a woman for making any of those. So mm -hmm. that's our, our hope and vision for the future. Less of who you should be, more of who you are. <laughs> Thank you questions? very much. Um, what a great discussion. What a great magazine. I got a feeling there's a lot of questions here in the audience. <laughs> I was watching the faces. 
We have uh, a couple of microphones here. This is Catherine Rodriguez, who is the Loose uh, Program Director, and another pretty lady here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't, uh, I don't remember your name. But um, would you? Um, Absolutely. Let's take some questions. That's actually Jessica Springer with the Heritage Foundation. Wonderful. So if you just yes. raise your hand, if you have a question, and uh, make sure that you have a mic in your hand so anyone watching uh, can hear your question as well. And if you wouldn't mind giving your name and where you're working or affiliated or uh, uh, so we can know who you are. Would you, um, Karen, would you like to call on people? Uh, Do we have questions? Oh, I see one in the back. Okay, awesome. Hi, I'm Dustin Sickens. I'm a reporter with LifeSiteNews.com. My question is, is it, a, is, a, is it a chicken or egg question? Is it women are being told they should be attractive in a certain way to attract men? Or is it because women should feel better about themselves and being sexy in and amongst women? You know, again, which came first? Is it appealing to men or women trying to empower themselves among other women? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that there has to necessarily be a which comes first. I think that we do have sort of an innate desire to sort of look and feel our best. And I think that, you know, as a, in any culture, I mean, you go all around the world and those standards are very different uh, and the way that that gets expressed and played out. But, you know, throughout history, the way that you dress communicates a lot about who you are. And I don't think that you know, wanting to feel good is necessarily um, something that, like, it has to be for some kind of end game. I do think that a lot of the messaging that's in, in magazines, and particularly in sort of the younger women's magazines, is that you know, the way that you dress to attract a man is in a certain way. Um, even there, I think that people acknowledge that you don't always want to dress that way when you're in the workplace, and that there's a, a certain time and place for different things. Um, so I don't think that it's, you know, it has to be, we only dress to attract men, and we only dress to, uh, to be competitive with other women. I think that there's a lot of cultural signals that are going into the way that we think about getting dressed, but that ultimately most people you know, want to feel like I look my best in whatever it is that I'm choosing to wear, and that it's communicating what I want it to communicate. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great answer, and I, I think that plays into the fashion question a lot, but I also think that um, when it comes to women's magazines, the standard of what is beautiful is for a man. So um, often women aren't encouraged to be beautiful in the language surrounding um, the articles towards their own looks and also in the visuals, the way they're represented. They're often not encouraged to look beautiful in a holistic way. It's often very hypersexual and with the um, innuendo and implied, if not explicit, recommendation that their beauty is to attract and keep a man. Um, when I had my first child, in, yeah. When I when I had my first child in 1980, um, I decided to stay home, and I was it. I was the only mom home, and it was very hard for me to find, really go out and search for other moms who were home. Now that daughter, who is now at home with one and one on the way, um, it seems in Northern Virginia where I live that there are many, many more mothers at mm -hmm. home now. And have you see? She belongs to like a which you may want to do, you know, find out about. There's a young mother's organization that's a nationwide thing, and they call each other, and they get together, and they meet, and they find other girls in the neighborhood, and, that's you know, awesome. do, you know, meet with their kids and go to the zoo and whatever. Um, it seems to me that, that the idea of it being okay for moms to stay home has changed somewhat, at least in this part of the country. Have you, have you all seen that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's happening, um, and that it's sort of like under the surface a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say, and it depends on the community, right? Like I think that in um, especially more religiously minded communities, and I would say more probably more conservative communities, you find it very often where people are making the decision to stay home. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the messaging that we get in women's magazines and in popular media are often not that that's okay. It's like, oh, people do that, and I guess that that's an okay decision if you decide to do it. Yeah. But it's certainly not the encouraged track. So I think that it's definitely happening, but it's not what people are talking about. I think that's why you see this explosion of mommy blogs, right? And all of these, yeah. you know, yeah. things are, people are like, oh, I'm like desperate to find somebody else who's going through this because I don't see it anywhere else. So I think it's there, but they're trying to, to find connections. I think it's really lonely, too. I know a lot of young young mom friends who say it's hard to make this connection, so I'm glad to hear that your, your daughter is actually able to plug in. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Ross Marchand. I'm an intern at the Heritage Foundation. And my question has to do with um, the sexualization of expression and the trends that we're looking at. So it seems on the one hand that things get more liberal with each passing generation. But on the other hand, it also seems that uh, there were time periods like the 1980s where things became more conservative overall. So if we're looking at the 1980s for an example, um, was, was there a trend towards conservatism in expression? Or, or since the 1960s, has it been a consistent um, liberal, uh, liberalization? That's a good question. I think um, yeah, the, the data that I've seen is a little inconclusive. It does seem as though there's like some oscillation, right? I think um, I was just reading last week that the number of people who report to be sexually active before being married is the same as in the 60s, hmm. but it feels like more now maybe. <laughs> um, so I think that, uh, that, yeah, there's probably like ebbs and flows and um, – I was born in 85, so I can't speak firsthand, but my, my parents say that the 70s were wild and crazy. And, um, the 60s, too. Yeah. I was there. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it does, seem, it does seem as though there are some ebbs and flows, and um, yeah, I think it's really interesting that even today, people who claim to not support traditional marriage and child-rearing you know, the elites in society are the ones who are actually getting married and having children mm -hmm. and, and staying home with them. Um, so, yeah, I think that there's, there's a little bit of a dichotomous strain there. I would say that, and I would also say that um, it, in the increasing global conversation about women's issues, I think there's a really great opportunity now, um, whether conservative or liberal, to reach across party lines and to talk about these issues. There's some really amazing topics where there's a lot of common ground, um, such as sex trafficking and um, the harms of pornography, where even those on the hyper-liberal bent would probably agree with those of the socially conservative. Um, so whether or not there's oscillation, as Kara Carrie mentioned, I do think that it's also ripe for opportunity um, where we are right now. My name is Rebecca Robson. I'm an intern at the Heritage Foundation. My question has to do with women who do decide to go back in, or to be a stay-at-home mom. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, and it's something I really treasured and valued, but even people in our close family ridiculed her for this. Mm -hmm. So my question is, it's seen as a submissive and almost frumpy position to go back home and stay with your kids. How do you reclaim that as a beautiful thing? Because we're, we're talking about power and being in the workplace and that being, that being beautiful. How do you see that as a positive? How do you reclaim that? Yeah, I mean, I think for the, all the conversations that have been happening over the last two or three years are incredibly encouraging to me, and I do think that the rise of the mommy blogger is a good thing. Um, the fact that we have so many women who have a forum through the internet and through other places to really show these sort of beautiful real-world examples of what that, that can be. Um, but I think that, that it's also very positive when we have things like stay-at-home dads and when we start promoting... Um, more generous sort of uh, leave policies for, mm -hmm. for people, encouraging women to come back into the workplace eventually um, and making it less of a stigma. So I think that you know, for us in, a, in our magazine, we've tried to show stories of real women who are moms who are making it work in different ways. We had, you know, having mm -hmm. a stay-at-home mom writing article, we had a profile of a woman who has eight kids and she's a legal consultant and she kind of manages to do both worlds. Um, so I think that showing and sort of upholding these stories of women who are really trying to make it work in, in different ways um, can kind of give us that mental freedom to write this story uh, for ourselves to say, like, I'm not going to feel bad about wanting to stay home, or I'm not mm -hmm. going to feel bad about wanting to work part-time. I think that that's a wonderful thing, too. We need, we need mothers in the workplace to sort of raise their hand and be like, hey, we need to make the workplace more friendly to us mm -hmm. if you value our input here. So I think that we need women in all these different spheres. Um, but yeah, I think like showing more of these stories and, and being able to see who these women are, putting a face to it and not just talking about them like they're this weird quasi thing that happens to the side sometimes, um, mm -hmm. I think that helps. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think your mom's not alone. Um, and there's a, there was a study done, the motherhood study, by the Institute of American Values, and it showed that women that stayed home actually do um, feel more pressured and, and slightly shamed 
um, by the broader community for that choice. Um, so I do agree with Kara on showing the stories of women who are doing it, but also raising um, our voices as women to sort of combat, um, I don't want to raise the whole conversation about Sheryl Sandberg leaning in, but um, she's talking about leaning into a corporate environment that has been largely dominated by men and sort of in that way, okay, we're leaning into something which maybe we need to be totally revolutionizing the way that the corporate environment looks. Um, to have greater stay-at-home options, like Kara mentioned, also work-at-home options, um, which are becoming more prevalent, I think, um, and I think will continue to go that way, especially with the um, more knowledge economy that we're seeing and um, being able to work from laptops and things like that. Um, so I guess that's the only thing I would add there. But Maybe another thing to remember is that it's not always an option in families anymore mm -hmm. for a mom or a dad to stay home. Mm -hmm. The uh, economic destruction wrought by the current presidential regime, and cutting jobs from their policies, mm -hmm. cutting hours. Um, often mom and dad both have to work in order to feed the children and pay the mortgage. So it's a wonderful thing when it's an option, but there's an awful lot of families where it's not an option. Hi, Libby Barnes from Live Action. Um, so I've seen a lot of press saying Verily is a breath of fresh air. And that's, you know, conservative, liberal, religious, non-religious, et cetera. Um, however, have has there been any dismissal of you as, oh, conservative, or oh, liberal hippie? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. has, there been, has there been press that just says, you're just saying this, you're just going non-Photoshop because you are blank? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd say we, we don't necessarily get pressed that way. We tend to get, you know, Facebook comments and things like that. <laughs> In um, private. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but no, I think that uh, we choose topics that we want to take a stand on and often are things that I think we have a lot of support on both sides of the aisle. Like we're non-political, we're you know, not trying to be a Republican or liberal or you know, Democrat or anything like that. Um, I think we're trying to really bring light to things that are going to be the best for women. And so I think like Ashley was saying earlier, mm -hmm. issues like sex trafficking, issues like pornography and, and the detriment that that is for men and for women in, in relationships. and. Um, all of these things where, like, that's not a political issue. So, you know, certainly you always get commenters who want to say whatever they're going to say. But <laughs> I'd say for the most part, people have been really receptive to the kinds of conversations that we're starting to have and our approach. Because I think we try to take a pretty balanced and measured and intelligent uh, take on these topics and not, you know, making it very inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people at first weren't exactly sure what to make of Verily, you know, like, um, is it just some religious girls making a religious <laughs> magazine? What exactly is it? Um, and, and slowly it's become, as the brand has grown and as the conversation has developed, um, especially around the no Photoshop policy, a lot of people would su you know, suspect this was some sort of PR move. Um, and it really wasn't. It was very naturally interwoven into the ethos of the entire publication. But it did wind up starting a global conversation that was apolitical. Um, so American Eagle now has a, a spring campaign for high school girls. It's a global campaign. It's called Airy Real. And they're not Photoshopping their models. So that's, you know, really exciting. That's a non-political stance to take. But then from sort of behind the scenes, I would say, although the readers seem to be pleased, there has been some pushback from the photographers um, and stylists slightly who, you know, express hesitation at um, working with models of different sizes and um, maybe not being able to find sizes that would fit them, things like that. But by and large, it's been mostly positive. I would take a question around the side, maybe. Hi, yeah, Courtney Holloway with the American Association of Christian Schools. And I guess my question centers on uh, a lot of the magazines are the OK and Us magazine type, you know, I guess fair. And it's a lot of, you know, focus on the celebrity culture and, and the Kim Kardashians of the world. So how do you address the celebrity culture, you know, and stay relevant but not focus on what they usually tend to, I guess, not focus on on those magazines? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we, we just shy away from the whole celebrity thing. Like, we talk about things people are talking about, like, the Oscars, and we talk about culture, and you know, kind of what we what we say is that we try to take the good from everywhere, and so we certainly talk about movies and about things that are going on. Um, and I think the slight shift is that like these people can be very um, recognizable examples of people we can look to, without putting people on a pedestal. And one of the examples that I typically give, because I think a lot of 
a lot of high school girls in particular looking for role models mm -hmm. and looking again for these narratives. And you know, I think of somebody like uh, Emma Watson, who typically or previously had been quoted as uh, sort of promoting modesty by saying that I don't need to take off my clothes and you know, less is more, um, or sorry, mo having like, you know, more is better. And then she went and did a cover shoot where she's like in lingerie on the cover of Glamour. And then people were saying, she's grown up now. Now she's a woman. It's like she was a woman before she <laughs> stripped down to, you know, her, her lingerie. So I, I, I'm a little wary of trying to put people on a pedestal. Um, I think, you know, Emma Watts is a beautiful young woman. And I think she does a great, great job acting. Um, so, yeah, I think we try to be a little careful about that. So one over there. Yeah. And then this one in the back, too. Hello. Is it okay if I walk up? You can't see me. Hello. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Gabrielle Jackson, and I'm with the Miss United States organization. And I'm actually Miss Fairfax County. I'm running for Miss Virginia here in a couple of weeks. And um, I just want to thank you so much for many of us know, will have been told, you know, sex sells. But we know we're all here because class sells, because we want to be aspiring to, to something more. And so I'm just curious as to... What kind of partnerships, maybe even some unexpected ones, have you found different coalitions that you've been able to build working either with organizations or with people who you may not have expected to be supportive of your message? There's been, there's, I think there's a lot of like women's organizations yeah. who were surprised at, I guess, but um, I can't remember, trying to think like Girls, Girls Globe reached out to us. And yeah, there's been some. There's, um, girls and women's organizations involved with the UN, um, working on women's policy there. Um, of course, you know, jewelry brands, things like that, but also um, high school girls organizations that work to, to build up and to sustain character amongst young women. Um, trying to think others that kind of come out of the woodwork. I, I, say that I think because of the topics that we've chosen, I wouldn't say that I've been surprised, but I've been very heartened yeah. by the people who want to kind of be involved and, and do something. Because I think one of the things that this really surprised and excited me is just how many people really want to do better for young women. Yeah. And especially for young girls, I think that um, so many people just see things like that study that we were talking about earlier with the girls you know, ages six to nine. And I think that we're becoming more aware of the effects that it has on young girls and trying to empower them to make healthy decisions as they get older. Uh, and I think that that's a, an issue that's near and dear to many people's hearts. And so I think that it surprised me just how, how passionate people are about it and um, how much people really care and want to do better. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both the organization and the individual level. So individuals will approach us and say, we want to be your ambassador on our campus or something like that. What can we do? Um, and so it's really exciting, and I think, you know, Kara can attest to this too, but there's always opportunity to approach and ask, you know, about partnerships too. Yeah. Okay, there's one in the back the and then, uh, oh, over there. Yeah, behind yeah. the pole. Mm -hmm. We'll do that next then. Hi, I'm Allison Howard with Concerned Women for America. Thank you guys for what you're doing, and um, I think we touched on two things that I just wanted to get your thoughts on. Um, both of you stepped out of what you're pursuing to go after your dreams, which I think is so neat and creating this magazine. But also with the stay-at-home mom option not being available to so many, and the president's health care law hurting people in the sense that they may not be able to take that option that someone can stay home. Our young girls are sitting in front of the TV more often. They're able to have their hands on magazines that come in. Are you guys seeing that your demographic is already tainted to the point where we're reacting to what they've been taught? That six to nine age group, how do you reach that six to nine age group, maybe even younger, with a positive message? I have sisters, many here do. The young Nickelodeon or um, Disney shows are not appropriate for them, mm. in my opinion, yeah. in my old age, are not appropriate <laughs> for them. Um, everyone's dating. Everyone's maybe uh, acting in their dating relationships how we wouldn't expect them to for a kid's show. Mm -hmm. So uh, just a question, if Verily is reaching them, or if you see a gap there that maybe someone here could jump in with their future dream to reach those young girls, what do you think is missing in that conversation for them? Yeah, I mean, so we, our magazine in particular is addressing women more in their 20s and 30s, and we very much are specifically speaking to that demographic. But I think for us what we've seen is that 
like we want to start doing more, I think on a nonprofit level, like from a business perspective, it's really difficult to do things that are marketed to teens and actually make money. Um, but I think that there's just a huge set of opportunity for um, you know, nonprofits and outreach and, and I think even things as simple as mentoring young women yeah, and getting absolutely. involved in you know, sports organizations or through church or through other places where young girls are looking for mentorship. Um, it's amazing the one-on-one -on -one connection that you can have and they just look up to you because you're older and wiser <laughs> and know what's going on. Um, so I think that, that yeah, it, there's a huge gap there that needs to be addressed and um, certainly something needs to, to fill the void for mm -hmm. young women, and especially in popular media. Yeah, and Verily is just one option. So if anybody has ideas, <laughs> there's a Happy lot to, to be you. done. <laughs> yeah. I just have a follow-on question to what was asked previously. Have any men's organizations tried to support you in any sort of public forum, or is it simply women's organizations getting behind mm -hmm. your cause? Yeah, I mean, we've we partnered with the Art of Manliness um, for an article before, and they've uh, they've been fans. Um, we love so them; they're great. Art <laughs> <laughs> McKay is really fun. Yes. Um, and then I think that yeah, that we there's just not as many. I mean, honestly, like yeah. there's not as many men's organizations that that you know address this kind of thing, but. Um, I've spoken to some high schools where I also sort of have a corresponding piece of this for young men and kind of the the media that they're encountering and the kind of cultural norms that they're battling and dealing with. Um, and there's a guy, Jackson Katz, who I think is does really great work in sort of highlighting that. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. We get a lot of emails from young men who, well, I just happened to, you know, pick up Verily because it was on somebody's coffee table. Oh, like, uh, yes. <laughs> so I think that there's certainly, like, men who are also wanting to know about, you know, better relationships and, and cultural issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe a couple more questions, and then we can talk informally. Um, how about over in the corner there, and then up in the back, and then if we have time here. Um, my name's Karen, I'm with uh, the Heritage Foundation, I'm an intern. Uh, my question is about the hookup culture. You guys mentioned that in the beginning, and um, how do you think it's a, this culture is affecting women? You know, where is it starting, and what is Verily or other organizations doing about it? Hmm. That's a good question. I'll let you talk about <laughs> Okay, uh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, there's a really interesting book that just came out actually last year. It's called The End of Sex. It's written by Donna Freitas. Um, she is a researcher and she did a nationwide study on the phenomenon of the hookup culture. Um, she doesn't examine the origins as much, um, but there's a lot of speculation about where it comes from. Um, there's been cultural shift in the decline of courting, for example, so the previous ways where we lived in the marriage, um, the, we call, I call it the cultural marriage model, where relationships were naturally on a trajectory that would end in marriage. Now we're in the relationships model, where the end goal is to be in a relationship. And women who are single or have had you know, um, unsuccessful marriages, they feel ashamed um, because they're not participating in this, in this vibrant relationships model. Um, but in the marriage model of the culture, there was courtship, which facilitated um, vows and you know walking down the aisle and saying I do and then that declined um, to give rise to dating and then dating declined even more so it's becoming this sort of micro soundbite culture and that translates into relationships as well um, hooking up has begun I mean it begins so early earlier and earlier but it's rampant on college campuses um, as well and by and large dating has gone by the wayside I think we're sort of seeing a regeneration in you know, young professional circles in New York, maybe in DC too, I hope, fingers crossed. Um, but you know, the hooking up mentality is one where um, two people are using each other for, for pleasure and without this sort of trajectory that would naturally end in marriage and without the sort of cultural support for marriage and the broader cultural understanding about the civic role of marriage, I think hooking up is probably only going to continue. The way that Verily um, approaches it is, well, the policy is um, relationship advice that goes beyond sex tips. So in all the relationship advice, um, the underlying, underlying ethos is that women are highly defined by the types of relationships that we are in. And so if we're in healthy, um, vibrant, holistic relationships where we're becoming the best version of ourselves, then we're really thriving in life. Um, and so our approach to all the relationship content takes that tone. Um, do we talk about hooking up? 
Not as often, um, naturally, because there's just so many other things to talk about, frankly, um, yeah. that other magazines aren't talking about. And so um, rather than tackle it head on, um, you know, about like bashing the hookup culture, we prefer to broaden the conversation um, to approach multidimensional levels of it. Okay, this lady in the back, and then this gentleman will be the last. Hi, I'm Carly. I'm from the Susan B. Anthony List. I'm interning, and I'm an undergrad at Catholic University. And my question for you is, what do you say to the women who don't care about being sexually objectified or the girls on mm -hmm. campus who actually relish in it? I mean, how do I open up this discussion on my campus? Yeah, I, guess I, I struggle with that myself because I think, um, you know, convincing somebody who's like, I really love only eating fried chicken and you can't tell me one way or another that eating a salad is better for me, it's like, Okay, I mean, <laughs> I think that you know we can continually point to research and you know sort of remind them, but I think ultimately it comes down to friendship and one-on-one -on -one relationships, mm -hmm. and you know spewing facts at people isn't really mm -hmm. going to move their hearts. Um, I think that, and even you know, I've noticed it with me I, because I've become better friends with people. You know, you understand where they're coming from and what their family background is and what relationship. Uh, um, have uh, relationships have affected them and I think we can just be so much more compassionate to them in that pain and in, in what they're experiencing um, to actually have a real conversation because otherwise you're just trading facts and figures back at one another and yeah. you know there's not really an open conversation so I, I try not to worry too much about like people who really don't want to have a conversation about it I'm like okay well we can be friends and maybe one day we'll grab a beer and like get into a really great conversation about relationships and what do you really want what do you really think um and start to have better conversations that way. But yeah. I think without the personal relationship, it's really hard to, to say much. Yeah, and I would just say too that um, barely speaks to the hunger in people's hearts, but people have to be in touch with that hunger too. Um, mm -hmm. And so in addition to the personal relationships, I wouldn't undermine the power of storytelling um, to tell stories about what is actually possible for these women um, if and when they wanted to stop objectifying themselves. Mike down here. Thank you all for your time and for coming out this afternoon. Um, two brief unrelated questions. Uh, the first, uh, Lori Gottlieb wrote an interesting um, New York Times op-ed piece two weeks ago on egalitarian marriages mm -hmm. leading to less sex and more frustration mm -hmm. due to more sharing than normal of traditionally role-specific um, house chores. Um, how would Verily, with a motto like less of who you should be, more of who you are, respond um, to that? And then second question, Kara, maybe you can speak to this more because you've worked with Love and Fidelity Network, great, or, great organization. Um, my sister is a college student studying communications and finds herself um, very attracted to African American men. What kind of um, social hardships or obstacles should she prepare herself for in those relationships? Do you want to tackle the first one? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that <laughs> is, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't have too much to say about the Lori Gottlieb on a, article, honestly. I mean, I think it's an interesting perspective. Um, I think that we actually had an interesting article from Tim Carney, uh, was it last week or two weeks yeah, ago? Yeah. <laughs> um, about, he was talking about submission in marriage and sort of what does that really mean and that they both, sub we submit to one another and in the way that we approach a relationship. Um, and I think it's kind of similar here where, you know, different relationships are going to have different dynamics. And I do think that they're, you know, is it because like it's a strict division of, of labor a bad thing? I know for some people it seems to work really well. For some people, you know, they like to have certain things where they have deference to someone else. So um, I don't really have too much other to say than that. But I'll let mm -hmm. Ashley tackle the, well, the relationship. Well, uh, <laughs> so I thought the New York Times article was really good. I think it's an interesting um, perspective to take, just to add an end to what Kara had mentioned. I think actually the most salient point in the article to me maybe because I'm just passionate about this, but it was the part where she talks about um, the role of pornography in shaping men's expectations and relationships. And she says that um, in pornography, women's sole goal and desire is to please the man, and that is different from real women. They have no desires at all, in fact. 
Um, and I think that that is a powerful statement to make when you talk about the ways that pornography shapes men's understanding of what women really want and what actually pleases them. So I think that's a lot of food for thought. Um, in terms of, was it your sister that you said? She, okay. I think that um, multicultural relationships are ones that can be very vibrant. And I think um, we've all had friends who have um, dated and married people from a variety of different races and, um, and can find those very, very enriching. And I wouldn't say that um, one race or another typically um, provides unique um, differences, but I would say that it could be a great opportunity for her to expand her horizons and learn more about um, the world and the ways that different cultures shape people's understandings of it. Isn't Ashley good? I was thinking, what's the answer to that one? <laughs> Are you at Heritage? I, I'm sorry, I didn't miss no, your name. Sorry, uh, Joshua. Joshua. Yeah, thank you. No, that was excellent. That was excellent. Let, let, before I wrap up, let me just have one final word on marriage here. I'm the grandmother. So I'm gonna, I recently became a grandmother. This year I've been married 40 years. Woo. Yay! <laughs> and I know some of you perhaps are married longer, a couple of you here. But here's the thing about marriage. You all look young, and so many of you are going to have wonderful marriages, I know. Um, Anybody who tells you a good marriage is easy is either lying or stupid. There's nothing <laughs> easy about it. Or that there's a formula. Mm. Of course, you know, there's certain traditional values and people of faith and things like that. You have to share certain common values. But what I would always say to people who were very eager to give me advice was, if you've been married longer than I have happily, I will take your advice. And there were very few people who would do that. And I don't mean to uh, ad criticize uh, general thoughts about marriage and what makes it good, but it's such an incredibly individual thing, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and finding the right person that you share the values with is so key. You know, the sexual part of it is tremendously important in the beginning. You have to feel attracted to somebody. But as the years go on, it's always there, and it's always important, but it's not nearly as important as the character, as you know, the integrity, as the loyalty, as the willingness to give and to share and to you know, pick up when it's needed and, and all that. So it's, there's not really a magic formula for it, but I do think that what, what you are doing in your magazine is tremendously important for so many women who really um, struggle in the popular culture today. And conservative women, good women, young women, we work with them at Claire Booth Luce a lot. Mm -hmm. And I just want to commend you tremendously for what you're doing with the magazine. And I want to thank you so much for coming by today. And I guess we'll have a lunch outside and we can talk some more. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you so much. Thank you. And before we end, uh, since the Heritage Foundation is a uh, Think Tank, and we're Educational Institute. We thought we'd give you some books for reading for the drive back oh, to New York. I'm um, Alexis de Tocqueville's <laughs> uh, Democracy in America, which oh, is the foundation nice. of building any good uh, culture, right, that yeah. you can build these principles upon. So thank, thank you again you. for joining us today. I have some wonderful limited edition coffee mugs with Mrs. Lewis's famous saying, awesome. what is it? <laughs> No good deed goes unpunished. And of That's course, great. every woman needs a purple, purple, loose tope. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Gibson. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. So there's lunch across the hall. If you guys would just join us there, that'd be wonderful.